All right, how are we doing back there? All right, we are officially on time, so I think we'll start rolling. Thank you, everybody that came here today. Um, I'm one of the co-organizers, and I'm speaking. I didn't plan that. Um, we had two speakers cancel, and I actually said I don't want to speak here, but I'm glad that you're here, and I'm glad I get to share this anyway. Um, yes. So uh, last year, I was not here at Android Summit. The reason was um, the night, the day after Android Summit, my daughter was born. So this is kind of our Android Summit baby. Uh, her name is Brooklyn, but she, her birthday is on Saturday. So um, yeah, hi. Uh, <laughs> let's get started. So yeah, follow, you wanna follow me online? My name is Handstand Sam. There's stuff behind that, but I won't talk about that today. As I said, unless you tweet it, it didn't happen. So use the Android Summit hashtag. Um, I'm a lead Android engineer. I do work here at Capital One. I'm also an Android and Kotlin Google developer expert. And today we're gonna be talking about DIY or do it yourself dependency injection with Kotlin. So why am I even up here talking about this? Um, dependency injection, as I said in like the abstract, is like this super complicated thing that only the most senior engineers know. And I wanna demystify the topic. It's really not that crazy. Um, also, I wanna show you how you can implement do it yourself dependency injection if you choose and why we ended up doing it in our project. So our team story to give you a back, a history of why we actually approached this was we got tasked to build a reusable SDK. So my team previously actually built apps, um, but our features got pulled into another app and they said, you, you're gonna build a reusable SDK. Um, and this is the first time we're building this complex SDK and we realized there are a few constraints we didn't have when building an application. Um, the product requirements that they gave us for building this SDK are as follows. They wanted this SDK to be used in different apps and in different code bases. So it's not like, it's my code base, I can do whatever I want, it's like, get as minimal impact as you can because you don't know what app you're gonna be in and what's gonna happen there. Um, you shouldn't assume that clients even wanna use a third party library, especially transitive dependencies. You don't wanna bring along retrofit, JSON, and all these things because they're importing your one little SDK and then they get all this stuff for free and they probably don't want it. So stay very lean and lightweight. Um, make the SDK configurable so that each client can do their own thing. Maybe like set an image or set text or theming or things like that. Um, but then there are also technical requirements. So I kind of made up these, all these things are kind of like after the fact, but <laughs> kind of summarizing how it works. So our team on a technical level, we wanted to use reactive programming. The way we got away with that is we couldn't use RxJava, but Kotlin coroutines and channels are there, so we went ahead and got away with that. Uh, we wanted immutability. As Chet said in his keynote, Java is really horrible for immutability, um, but luckily Kotlin is. You have vowels and um, you can make it so that your data is very immutable. Um, we wanted modular code, so we wanted the ability to write small modules that had single purpose. Um, we wanted that. Same thing with single responsibility code, well-tested code, um, big about testing, and avoid third-party libraries like we're talking about. Finally, little thing, 100% Kotlin, because we started this SDK about a year and a half ago. Google had already announced it was a supported language. We said, we're gonna do 100% Kotlin. And along with the other projects, we said, we still want dependency injection. So when you think dependency injection, you think Dagger, which is great. But in this talk, we'll obviously do the do-it-yourself method, kind of do a little comparison there between Dagger and a few other libraries. One of our requirements, though, is why 100% Kotlin? And using Keynote's fancy features, we can slide out. Uh, Kotlin makes coding easy and concise, and it also, in turn, makes dependency injection easy and concise. It actually makes it something approachable, where if you did this in the Java world, your code would be bloated everywhere, there would be immutable things. It just wasn't something maintainable, but in Kotlin, it is very doable. So the language features that actually allow you to make this do-it-yourself method actually doable are name parameters. If you used that before, think of like the, the example in the keynote this morning where we had in four parameters that were integer, it was like top, bottom, left, right, and so forth. They're all ints. And in Java, if you wrote that out, it would look like 0, 0, 10, 9, or something like that. It doesn't make any sense. But in Kotlin, you can use name parameters where it says like left equals 0, right equals 0, or something like that. I don't have an example right here, but we'll see some more later. Uh, default parameters are key, so we didn't have this in Java either. What it means is when I define a class, I'm saying, you know what, this, par this parameter, if they don't specify it, I have something that they can use. So that was a really key language feature. By lazy, which allows you to have a variable that doesn't get initialized until you access it, and once you access it, that value is cached, and lambdas, which are nice ways to basically have a function that you can pass around and execute. So too long, didn't read. These things are always nice, so if you wanna leave after this, it's okay. 
Uh, Kotlin, yes, so we're gonna use that in the do-it-yourself recipe. We're gonna use constructor injection. I haven't told you what that means, but if you know what it means, you can leave after two more bullet points. Um, so we wanted incremental builds. This is something that was super important. We wanted a very fast build, because if you've worked on a large app, sometimes it can take five minutes, or two minutes, or 20 minutes, or whatever it is. So by getting um, incremental builds, you have the ability so that when you change one file, then that whole module doesn't have to be rebuilt. Um, and then sadly, with our sad face, there are some hacks that we have to do to make this work uh, for activities and fragments, because we don't own activity and fragments. They're owned, they're, their creation is owned by the Android framework. So please go ahead and leave if you'd like to, that's it. But <laughs> if you wanna learn more, let's dive in. So why do you even wanna use dependency injection? Because it enables all the cool things that I like to talk about and you like to do. Uh, enables testing, it enables debug features, and it enables mock flavors. So all these talks that I've done, I couldn't have done unless I had dependency injection to do them. And they're all things that as you get into more advanced apps, then that's more than just like one simple screen and you're getting to something you wanna to ship to production and, and do a bunch of things with you really want. So dependency injection is not this magical thing, as I said. I wanna demystify that only the lead engineers know about it. I didn't even know that much about it before either, um, <laughs> even though I'm lead. So like, I understand a lot more now. But this talk was originally given at Disney, because that was where uh, whatever DevFest Florida was given, so dependency injection is not Mickey Mouse. Dependency injection is swapping. I kinda came up with that last night, so we'll see if it works. But basically, it is use this instead of that. Um, so it's the ability to swap. It's not really swapping, but it's like, I have, anyway, let's look at some diagrams here. So also, if you wanna be more fancy, dependency injection is an inversion of control. Basically, the ability to swap out things. So you're passing in your dependencies instead of having your code already predefined them. You're able to swap. So let's look at what this might look like in a visual way. So we have our code here. This is like our class or something. And we have things that we rely on, dependencies. But in this normal way, like we'd have dependencies inside of our code. So we'd have a new one of these things or a new this. Um, but the problem is that isn't something that you can invert the control. The code owns that dependency. If you go ahead and take the dependency out and you inject it in, and it's really creepy how these little like blood droplets coming out of it, but like if you inject your <laughs> dependency into your code, for instance, a logger, then you have control over what actually gets sent into the code. At the end of the day, you just cared in your code that you have a logger. So maybe you want an Android logger because you're writing Android code and you want to run, like just print to the log cap. So that's awesome, but if you want to make it swappable and you want to use in your JVM unit test that Android log.d actually does nothing at all, then you want to use something else. So you just swap out and you can use your system out logger. So you pass that into your code and then your code can use that logger. As long as it maintains that contract, your code doesn't care, right? You're injecting these things. So inversion of control, or if you want this new thing, swapping. So we talked about the Android logger. This is just kind of a, you get burned on it enough times, but this is kind of a preaching thing. So please avoid static instances. In this case, you see like log.d. So that log is like this class that's already there and it's a static method on it. You have no ability to like swap that out. So the reason why this is bad is you have this like global state if it's referencing, representing something in memory or it'd be something that you can't change the behavior of. If it's something that actually has data in it, data in it you can't reset it between tests and various things. It just has a state that it had and it, you can never clear it or reset it. And it's very hard to mock. There are tools like PowerMock, and most people are like, yeah, just use PowerMock, it's fine. But, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I love you PowerMock people. Hopefully bring you to the other side. Um, but PowerMock is kind of slow and it's hacky, it uses all these reflection things that you might not want to use. So one way to get around doing that is you can actually do a delegate on top of a static class, which allows you to mock it. But that's something else. Uh, also, I said new is your friend. We don't actually have new in Kotlin, but you get a, a new instance. So a no this is the no dependency injection. So this is that like code containing the dependency. In this case, in our no injection repository, so this fake class, um, you have a logger and you have a database. The logger in here is an Android logger, so there's no way to change that out. It's always gonna be Android logger. So when you actually instantiate it and you call the method, it's always gonna print to Android log. So let's look at a few types of common dependency injection techniques that you can use to actually use dependency injection in this. So the first one is setter injection. And this is actually, I think, how Dagger kind of works a little bit behind the scenes. Um, 
But the way it is is you have this like late initialized variable like a logger. And what you do is after you create the instance, you're able to then set it on that value. So Dagger actually has some magic going on underneath where you have these like at inject annotations. And so it creates the object and then in your like constructor you say, use Dagger and inject these things in here. So it's kind of doing it or it's setting these things after the fact. You're not passing them in though. Constructor injection, like I said in that recipe that you could have left on if you had wanted to, but thank you for staying. Um, you can pass this into your class. So this is the constructor repository. You can pass in the logger. So I don't know how well you know Kotlin, but in the, I'm defining a constructor up here that has two objects you can pass in. And then when I actually create the object below, I'm able to use that lovely name parameter. So the logger is Android logger, and the database is a SQL delight database, and it's very readable. So why is constructor injection great for Kotlin? It's great because you have the default parameters like I talked about. So if you're mostly gonna use an Android logger, you can actually say, if you don't give me anything for a logger, then I'm just gonna use the Android logger, that's fine. But what's nice is, if you, don't, if you don't care about specifying it, you can just say, oh, I only care about the database. However, in your test, you could say logger should be the system out logger. So why does this whole do-it-yourself method actually make sense? You get compile time safety. That's one thing that people talk about when they talk about service locators and these things. I had to watch some other talks. I don't really know what that means, but essentially it's like you go look up that I need this sort of thing and it comes back. In this case, you're just creating objects, so you have that compile time safety. You're not using any third party, libra third party libraries because you did this yourself, and there's no magic. What I really like about this, and what I do when I get into a new project and I'm trying to figure something out is like, you're in this piece of code and you're like, how did they get this thing here? Like there's some magic dependency chain, but with do-it-yourself method, you just say find usages and it finds it. There's none of these add eject annotations and it came from here and there. There's a find usages. So that's one thing I really like about this. There's no magic behind it. Just find usages. It's a way of building up dependency graphs. So as we mentioned, aren't there libraries that do it for you? Yes. So let's take a look. Now, you must put on the eyes of an SDK developer in this case. That's the way I evaluated these libraries. Um, so the first thing is Dagger. Um, I talked about incremental builds and how code generation broke it. Up to very recently, there's some ways that they can get around it, but at the time we evaluated them, this is the case. Dagger used code generation, Toothpick used code generation, so that slowed down your builds because every single time you changed something, it had to generate all the files, um, and that took time. Coin and Coden didn't, so that was good. Rule out Dagger and Toothpick. Uh, other libraries will be, um, so Coin actually uses a single instance, and so that's very similar to the way we have like the static in memory variable, it's just coin dot do something, right? It's actually more of a service locator pattern, but it achieves the same goal. I don't care what people call them, but you get this goal of being able to swap things. Um, so Coin, it had a single instance, and the problem with that is we're an SDK. We come into an app, and if we're using coin.something, if another SDK is, or the app is, we're gonna like clash. So we can't really use that. Um, so that's ruled out. Now, is it available at the time? Code and now is available, but it wasn't at the time, so we kinda skipped over that. And all of them adds another dependency on a library, which is one of our core things coming in that we didn't want to do. However, I'm a very pragmatic developer. If there's a library that helps you do something that's really hard, you should use it. Unless you have somebody that's gonna pay you a lot of money to make it a little smaller and do it yourself. So, how much work is it to do it yourself? You kind of talked about how, what things are there, but let's, let's see what we have to do. Oh, good enough, not that much. <laughs> um, it's a little bit slightly more, more verbose than if you use Dagger or something like that. But I kind of challenge that a little bit because you have to have all these inject annotations and component annotations and everything all over the place. In this case, you're having to write a lot of name parameters. Like you could have a graph that has like 20 things on it, but with name parameters and default parameters, it's actually pretty readable. And if there's like advanced dependency injection features, then you have to do, deal with those yourselves. Here, who here uses dependency injection? Who here uses scoping? All right. So that's something you have to build in, but you can do that with like a factory. Um, you can just do it, like if you have an activity scoped thing, you could do it on your on create and on your on destroy. It's something you can very much do with this pattern. Um, so yeah, this is great for really uh, most use cases. If you don't already know a library very well, if you know a library in and out, like don't use this, use your library. It's your tool set, be pragmatic. So in practice, this is uh, kind of like my open source app that I use for everything. I migrated it to DIY dependency injection like last summer. I was like, I'm gonna write a blog post about that, but I still haven't. Um, but you know, you get some insights here. So you can check it out later on. It's just on my 
GitHub, Handstand, Sam, and it's pinned on there. So what's a graph? So a graph is like a collection of things. Um, in this case, it's a network graph, which provides us things that we have to access from the network. So actually, let's look at Shopping App to see what it does first. The Shopping App is just this um, app here, loads up, pretty simple. You have like a home view, a category of fruits, you go to an item, you hit a bunch of items, go to the cart, add, remove things, and check out, and then it says, no, I didn't do that yet. So anyway, it's your simple app, but I used Agger in this originally, and I was like, well, let's go ahead and see what happens, because in our project at work, we had used a uh, do-it-yourself injection. Let me see how much work it takes in here, and it actually cleaned up the code quite a bit. Um, that PR is kind of old and outdated, so I'm not gonna show you that, but let's just look at, the, look at this in the code. I guess I left everything open, but let's close all. All right, so the network graph. So this is the only thing, so what's nice about interfaces in general is you're only exposing the things, kind of like Chet said, on your APIs that people should interact with. Things underneath the hood, they shouldn't interact with because it's kind of behind the hood. So if you talked about a network graph, these are three things that are available. I want access to the categories of, of items that are there, the items that are in the category, and then the user that's logged in. So these are the things I can get from the network. These are the things I care about. Down below here, I have a network graph, which actually goes out and builds an OKHTTP OK client and uses Mashi for things and retrofit, and there's a lot of stuff here. But at the very end of the day, I'm only overriding three items, which are the things on the public API. So I'm creating these repositories, passing in my service. Um, but what's nice here is I've really abstracted it out. All my code actually um, just uses this interface. So if I look at category repo in my home activity, anyway, I could trace back, but it's only used there. Um, what's kind of cool about this network graph is I have different implementations of it. So we have the base network graph that we've seen that uses like OKHTTP OK and stuff, but I also have this flavor in this application that uses in-memory. So I have three versions, a mock server, a live server, which actually goes out to S3, is like for this example, and then an in-memory version. So if you look at the in-memory version of the graph, it still uses, uh, adheres to this contract. And so um, we're providing a category repo, an item repo, and so forth, but I kind of hacked it. So I have this like mock account here that I kind of made up. But inside of here, here's all the data that I would be returning from the API just as like something in memory. So what I've been able to do is, instead of like actually going out to the network, I'm just gonna say like, oh yeah, it was successful, here's your stuff, and then it returns back. So I had the ability to swap out a real networking graph and an in-memory networking graph because I used injection. Swappable. Um, all right, so let's look at some more things. So. Like I said, I mean, I didn't say this yet. Uh, each graph that you have is kind of like a dagger component, which is basically just a collection of dependencies. Um, in this case, the green highlight item is like the public API, right? So you have a network graph which contains everything under the hood here. Um, the repos though, those three P repos, user item and user uh, category repository, those are the only things that people care about interacting with. Everything underneath the hood here, all the orange, they don't. And so we can hide that behind this sort of design. Here's the session graph. So this is the other graph I have in here. Um, if we look at that, it exposes three things. So the other things that I need in my application are a session manager, who is currently logged into the shopping app. I need a shopping cart to add and remove things, and some user preferences so they can set things. I'm gonna kind of dig in the shopping cart a little bit. Um, the main thing here is the shopping cart DAO. So a shopping cart itself is just this wrapper that has all this business logic in it. So like incrementing, decrementing, but at the end of the day, there's one big thing that I wanted to do with dependency injection to be able to swap, and it's the shopping cart DAO. So a DAO at the end of the day, it's responsible for selecting all, finding things, inserting, updating. But if we actually look at it, there's three implementations. And this, I go into in another talk where I compare room and SQL delight, but I can go in and I have a full SQL delight implementation here. Or I have the in-memory version, which is similar to kind of the other one, where it just has like a mutable map. So I've just created a map of things in memory, I'm able to return those, or have something that uses the room database. But using dependency injection, I can just inject the one I want. At the end of the day, it's using that interface and it can be used. All right, so you might be like, well, how many graphs do you need and, and what's happening there? So we're a big fan of multi-module. I know we have over 60 modules on our project right now. Um, in this case, I don't know, we have about 10 in this sample project. But um, it's definitely nice to separate your code into modules because then you don't have all these like spider, or like these spider web uh, dependencies. It's not like all over the place, or spaghetti really is what it should be. Um, so an app graph in this case, and let me show you what that is. It's just like my application's way of 
of getting all of these things. So um, an app graph, this for this example is pretty uh, basic, but it has the session graph and the network graph, so I can access those. Um, but actually, let's look at where that app graph, maybe, yeah, let's see where the app graph is used. So um, if I went ahead to my application, my application, um, you can see that I generate this app graph in my application object. So it's a lazy object, I'm saying the app graph is gonna be this implementation here, and the network graph is gonna be this. This is using another thing I'm supposed to write a blog post about, but I haven't. Um, it's basically a way that you can use extension functions um, based on your flavor to like switch out what your implementation is. So in this case, if you're using the server, then you'd go ahead and you'd actually um, interact with these objects. But um, yeah, so you have this graph, and then the important thing is with injection is in, in Android, because you don't have the control to, to create an application or to create an activity or create a fragment, it's all done by the Android platform, then you can't do constructor injection. So it's kind of like, well, that's what you just told me to do, right? Um, yes, and that's why I have that little sad face at the end. So the, what you have to do then is wait till you're on, on create. Um, so in this case, I go ahead and create my application graph after on create, so that means the Android platform's already instantiated everything. This is the first time I can actually do anything with the app, so I, in this case, I'm just touching the graph, which basically initiates the by lazy, so now that's available in memory, and then I can go forward. So the app graph contained both of those. So modules, so each graphs and modules, so each graph can have its, own, uh, each module can have its own graph. So this is important as we got to like 60 modules or so. Not everything has a graph, but if you needed access to one, you could create one in each module. They didn't have to be reliant on each other. Um, but you do have this sad hack of getting into fragments and activities. So I think we talked about by lazy there already in the app graph. But we wanna go ahead and we did the graph being set up. Sorry, I just like updated these slides last night. Um, but let's look about the graph being access and activity. This is super important, because this is where it comes into constructor injection on Android. Well, it's not gonna work very well because you have the, the system creating everything. So let, this is where we actually wanna check it out. So let's look at our home activity. And so this activity is actually the one that we saw here where it just lists like all the categories out. So it's this one right here. And inside of here, we wanna get things from the graph. So as we already saw in our application, we have an application graph for our app where everything's kind of collected. We wanna go ahead and access that in our activity and pull things off the graph because the whole point of dependency injection is to be able to like define your dependencies in one place and pull them in. That way, since they're all like defined in one place, you can swap them out. So in this case, I need my session manager and I need my category repository. So I wanna pull my category and I also need my session manager to say that it was welcome back Sam Edwards. So in this case, these are two ways that you can get around the whole problem of static. First of all, this graph is accessing um, the graph via the application. So I've created this extension function on here, which goes ahead and grabs the graph from the application. So it's really great in that object that we had. Goes through layers of a few things. But now in my activity, I can go ahead and access these things. So I can say graph, give me the session graph and give me the session manager, and it, and it does it. Um, so I wanted to do this. See this don't do this. Let's go ahead and hit play. Um, so if you go ahead and try to access your graph before your application and your activity are already there, then you're gonna get this. Anyway, an app crash. Um, and you're gonna get the app crash is because you're trying to access it before it's been created. So this is this whole problem on Android. Android's controlling when the fragments are created, when the activities are created, when the application's created. And that's kind of beautiful part of the system, but also very frustrating and why we hate life cycles. So the way you get around this is two ways. So don't access the graph directly like this. There's two ways to get around it. I'm gonna go ahead and play it just so I'd have something that's not crashing. Um, but one way you can do it is by getting one of these getters. So if you're using a singleton, meaning that there's only one instance of it, well, and you don't need to cache that value, um, you can go ahead and just create a val with only a getter. So this will go ahead, get the value from the graph, and return it back to you. So everywhere I wanna interact with Session Manager, down below here, I wanna pass it in my view presenter. Uh, anytime I wanna access that, I can just go ahead and grab it and pass it in. Um, and that'll just access it from the graph. You can also do by lazy. And what by lazy does is it accesses it once and then caches the value. So in this case, and I'm just showing an example here, but you'd go out, you'd um, get the category repository, and then it would be cached here with that value. So you wouldn't be pulling from the actual graph the whole time. All right. So recap of the do-it-yourself recipe. Um, like I said, um, Kotlin, 
instructor injection. And Kotlin really is important here, right? So I don't know if I stress this enough, but like I had those things of like name parameters and default parameters and by lazy and things. And if you didn't have these, like if you did this in Java, it would just be like hundreds and hundreds of lines of code. And that's why things like Dagger exist, is it was a really big problem. Um, and like Dagger 1, it used reflection, which kind of broke a lot of things. And it was really performant though, but it was more of a service locator thing. So then Dagger 2 came along and solved that with all this code generation, but sorry, that's a really bad history. But like it, it was a really big problem in Java is what I'm saying. So you can use constructor injection. Um, you don't use annotations or code generation, which allows you to avoid the uh, incremental compilation issues. And you have those hacks for activities and fragments. So let me not spoil it. I'll do the reveal thing. All right, so challenges, nothing is perfect. Um, so you have that static availability. You have like the one instance, whether it is in your application or you have to just create an instance that you um, cache inside of your modules graph. Onboarding, so I'm gonna call this out that onboarding anybody to a new application is hard. Um, I thought that it would be easier, like, and I, I made this argument to the team, why are we gonna do this do-it-yourself method? Why don't we use Dagger? If we hire people from other companies, they know Dagger, and then they can just use our app. But like, not many people know it. <laughs> So um, anyway, onboarding is gonna be hard with any complex system you have in your application, but what I thought would help, I, I don't think really did. So like using Dagger, I don't think would have helped us in this case. I think the ability to go ahead and say find usages on these objects allows you to see where they came from, and I think that's more important than trying to find documentation on Dagger and figuring out how it works. Um, scoping, so as I talked about a little bit, um, scoping is hard, it's more of an advanced thing, um, but what you can do is just, um, you can create a lambda, and I'm sorry, I don't have an example in this in code, but you basically have a function that can get executed on your graph. That function can basically generate a small scoped piece of code that you need. And so on your application, on your activity created and your activity destroyed, you can go ahead and create one and destroy it, and that manages the scope to be only that activity when it's available. Key takeaways. You don't have to use a dependency injection library. So hopefully all of you see that dependency injection is possible without having to use a library and that it's not too crazy. There's no more magical annotations. The at inject annotation was actually really awesome at the time. Um, it came out of Bob Lee, I believe, who worked on uh, Google on the uh, Juice project. This is going way back, but Juice used to, used to be a dependency injection framework that got moved over to Android as well. It's kind of where Dagger started from, but that inject annotation kind of lives from there. Um, and the key takeaway too is that Kotlin language, the Kotlin language features that I've mentioned really make this concise and straightforward. Also, I want you to think that dependency injection is critical for any app. If you're building an app that you wanna do testing on, that you wanna do debug features, that you wanna mock things out, really wanna do anything, you need the ability to swap dependencies in and out. So you need dependency injection. As I mentioned, you don't have to use something specific, but hopefully with what I've explained here, it makes sense about how you could do it yourself. Obviously there's a little hacks, but there honestly isn't every solution you'd have on Android because of the whole application activity lifecycle thing. Hopefully this makes sense. Thank you. And I'll open up for questions. Anybody? Yeah. So, um, I, there's a few of them. The next blog post is actually gonna be about SQL Delight. I'm gonna try to do it next week, because um, DroidCon New York City is coming up and I'm talking there, but uh, I will try to get it soon. So, we'll see. If you can come babysit for a little bit at my house, then I can, I can do it. Oh, what's up? What's the benefit of setting up the graphs of dependencies versus just like referencing like the certain um, networking managers when I need them? Like I don't really understand the need for a graph. Um, so a graph is just a nice way of like collecting these in a central place. Like the ideal thing is you don't need a full graph of them. You just create the instance when you're there, but. Like in a networking graph, like there's a lot of things you have to configure and set up. So you don't wanna be creating that every single time you need one. So you want a central place where you've like configured what you need, you can then grab it at any point in time and make that networking call. So what's nice about a dependency injection is it's giving you a single, single place where you can configure that. And like I showed, there's a um, in-memory version and a mocked version and a live version and you can actually do those when you configure them in one place. I don't know if that's a good answer, but it's the best I got. Cool. All right. What's up? Yeah. Yeah, so with annotations are really nice if you use reflection, but um, I don't know, with, 
I don't know the exact answer to that, I guess. Um, with dependency injection in general, and what I've seen in patterns, you see a lot of uh, annotations using, being used for code generation, and then you saw everybody using it, and every library had it. It's very cool because you write just an annotation, it does all this magical stuff behind the scene. But then we saw these things where build times were getting so slow that we realized, oh, it's because we're doing all this annotation code generation stuff. So I'm finding that people kind of are flipping back. Um, you even see like the Android Gradle plugin team, they've actually enabled incremental builds. So thing for Room and for Dagger, there's a lot of use cases now where it is incremental. Um, but I've just, I've seen the trend where it's really helpful and then it's kind of not sometimes. So it's something that's still absolutely valid, but in the dependency um, use case, I, I don't think it's much needed. I'm just hearing Walmart. What do you say? Warm up. Warm up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Very important question. So this is where by lazy comes in. So when you created dependence, a graph of dependencies, if you're creating all of them on application on create, unless you need them at that point in time, you shouldn't. You should use something called by lazy. And what that would do is delay the accessing of it and initialization of it until you actually need it. So it's there, it looks like a val in Kotlin, but it's not actually gonna get executed and initialized until then. So very important, you don't want everything to be created, you wanna use by lazy. Yes? Yeah, so I think uh, kind of like recapping what I said, if you know Jagger well, and you want to use it, and it's okay for your use case, use it. Any dependency injection framework enables dependency injection, which is the thing that I want people to do. Um, if you haven't, if you don't know Dagger well or something, I would just consider you look at something like this because it is something that you can understand when you look at, you can find usages. I, Even though there is documentation on Dagger, I still haven't met anybody like that's just like, oh, it's easy. So that's kind of that. Any other questions? Yes. Um, yeah, so the, the beauty of it is setting up the graph and everything else, but accessing it, you could do in Java if you wanted to. It's a little bit more verbose, but not much at that point. Really, it's the default parameters, the by lazy, everything that you're getting in Kotlin when you're setting up the graph, that is the benefit. So you can mix it with Java. All right, thank you very much. Oh, yeah, one more. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure, so the question is like, if you don't want something scope to be an activity, you want it to be towards a customer session, let's say, um, obviously you have to do it yourself, but what you can essentially do is, when that session starts, you go ahead and use one of the factories to create all the objects you need, you cache it, and then in the time when the customer session ends, you then clear that out. So it is the manual approach, but really, that's what's happening underneath the covers of any other solution you have. So it, it might be like easier to read with the annotation, and, and that's kind of what I'm saying. If, if there are advanced things or things that you know in other frameworks, do it. But if you just think about how it works, yes, when I start a, start a session, I need to do this and create an object, and I don't want it to be there when it's over, so I just clear it out. Just set it equal to null. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Cool, um, thank you, I'll be here. Um, thank you very much for coming to Android Summit. Thank you for coming to the talk, I really appreciate it. Can I get one picture with everybody real quick? All right, cool. I don't know how to get everybody, maybe I'll go in the corner. All right, turn on selfie mode, here we go, zoom out. All right, everybody hands up. I can do a handstand after this, but let's get this picture when I mess it up. All right.